everyone. We've had a couple of requests for like a general overview of Mesopotamian history. Uh, so we sat down this afternoon and started writing one out and then realized that Mesopotamian history is far too expansive to be fit into a single hour. So we're doing it in two parts. Yeah, hopefully. it's going to make it a lot better. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're going to do, I've just realized we don't have dates for the later rook period. Oh, that's all right. We're just winging it. Cool. It's the end of the fourth millennium. That works. Uh, so we're going to start at the later Rook period, which, as my esteemed husband just told us, is the end of the fourth fourth millennium. Um, until it's when it writing's came... invented. Look, that's really all you need to know. Let's move on. There's <laughs> a bit more to it than that. Um, <laughs> it's a good job. This is going to be very professional and formal. You know, hopefully this will be utilized in classroom settings. Hopefully our archaeology presenter, uh, presenter professor will never see this, because if you tell him that the best thing about the later Rook period is that writing is invented, he will... <laughs> You will not be happy. That's true, that's true. Anyway, we're starting with the later Rook period and going down to the Old Babylonian period, which is the middle of the second millennium BCE. Um, and actually, that's about where my interest and knowledge completely breaks off. So next week is going to be fascinating for all of us. The thing to remember about this, besides the fact that we're amazing, <laughs> you know, remember that, um, is that uh, this is like an overview, bird's eye view, flyover sort of thing. So if we missed something that was totally intentional. Yep. Um, Not incompetent at all. At all. Um, but anyway, the plan is we'll do this week, then we'll do the finish the overview next week, do the end of the OB up to what the Seleucids, Hellenistic. Yeah. I know. No so one's, inter late. No one's like interested week. in the Hellenistic period. No one, except classicists. I mean, really classicists. Oh, gosh. We're anyway, going to get in a lot of trouble. We're going to get video. in so much trouble, especially with my friends who happen to be classicists. Um, anyway, take us through the Hellenistic period, and then following that, I'm going to come back to each period and do a separate video in more detail um, and cover all the stuff that we deliberately, deliberately left out this time around. Mm -hmm. Um, so if there's anything that you'd like more information on that we don't cover, leave a comment and I'll make sure to include it on the longer videos. That was an awesome introduction. Thank you. Anyway, having alienated half of our viewing public, <laughs> let's get going. Um, Maybe I could give like a, just yeah? a very broad overview. Um, so what we're talking about here essentially is the land around and particularly in between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So hopefully we'll have a map going we'll up right map. right now. Yep. And um, early on, this period is characterized by individual city-states. Um, and each one is governed by an, uh, a god or a goddess. And as time goes by, those city-states come under control of uh, a, a, a ruler or a dynasty um, and that grouping of you know city-states shifts you know who controls how many of them sometimes a, a particular uh, you know dynasty will uh, take over the whole of Mesopotamia that's right, right up from like Iran through to the Mediterranean sometimes it'll be these little disparate warring state zones um, and it kind of the way that Mesopotamian history is often taught is as a series of expansions and contractions mm. so you get um, an expansion of centralized power with one dynasty ruling from a main city taking all of Mesopotamia, part of Mesopotamia under control and then something happens and that power fragments and shatters and then you get a contraction of these little city states and then someone decides oh hey remember when that empire several hundred years ago wasn't that awesome we should do that again so then they go to war and they take over the area and expands 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 and then someone invades from outside um or there's a famine or any number of problems and then it all shatters apart again hmm. um so a really good resource i can do this right yep okay good a really good resource is uh, mark van der um, the history of the ancient Near East. The only time we can't do it is if we tell them that we wrote it. Oh, we yep. didn't write this. I didn't write it. No, no. no. Um, yeah, so it's a fantastic resource. Many of you may know about it, but um, it's yeah. a good overview. It includes a lot of interesting details, and it's mm. um, it's written as a textbook, so it's constantly being revised and updated. Mm. Uh, so highly recommended. Also, our son is in the back. 
hopefully lying down, but he may scream, and if you hear that, she may leave, and I'll have to flounder a bit. All right. All right, we'll get going. Okay. So, we're starting with the Uruk expansion, uh, which happens at the end of what is known as the Uruk period, um, like right at the end of the fourth millennium. And Uruk is a city in southern Mesopotamia that is often referred to as the first city. Um, it's the first place where you have, uh, or we think the first place where you have um, high population density, um, a lot of uh, craft specialization. So for the first time you have people who work all day at a job that does not involve producing food. Um, what happens when cities are formed is that um, you get a group of people who farm and they produce enough agricultural surplus that they can then sell it. They don't have to use it to live off. They can sell it so that people who, I was going to say choose not to farm. I'm not sure if it was a choice or a, this is how life is. Anyway, we're getting a bit astray here. So people who, who don't farm are able to make their living doing something else and then have money to buy food. Um, so that craft specialization allows for things like the invention of writing, um, pottery, different pottery styles emerge, um, large elaborate buildings are made because uh, the population does not have to spend its whole life working the fields. They have extra time so the kings and ruling families can employ them in, in buildings and in warfare and all kinds of exciting stuff like that. So we have a rook, we have the first city and something called the Uruk expansion. Exactly what this is has been debated. It's been um, hypothesized that it shows. Okay, so what it we'll is. We'll get into the details yeah. of that later. I'm sorry, I'm a, I can be a very detail oriented person. So the Uruk expansion is where southern Mesopotamian um, objects and artifacts appear through much of Mesopotamia, um, as far as Susiana, which is modern Iran, and up to Syria and Turkey. Um, exactly how it got there is a matter of debate. Was there an invasion? Was it trade? Did they throw it? Did they just throw it really far? Who knows? We'll go into that another time. Um, but this archaeological material includes archaic writing and things called beveled rim bowls, which are these uh, kind of conical... Um, You'll put a picture up. I'll put a picture up. They're okay. awesome. We like beveled rim bowls. Um, so some of the sites do appear to have been founded by people who have this southern Mesopotamian Uruk material culture. Um, some sites it appears in much smaller quantities um, and may be a sign of trade or maybe trading enclaves. So mm. we're not sure. We'll go into that another time. Um, so the early writing that I mentioned is also a characteristic of the later Rook period. And we've got a video on that, uh, one of the daily data. Yeah, it's so either up or is coming. Up. I think it's coming up early this week. Um, but it includes the use of clay tokens for um, signifying uh, object. Uh, commodities and the exchange of commodities, clay envelopes in which these tokens were embedded, numerical tablets. These are later developed into complex numerical tablets. Assyriologists are good with naming stuff. Um, numerical ideographic tablets and protocuneiform. Um, one of the most famous pieces of artwork from this period is the Uruk vase. And I did actually do a video of the Uruk vase I last guess you week. Did. So check that out. Um, and one of the most important archaeological um, sites, again, is Uruk. The most important part of Uruk for this period is the Ayana the Ayana precinct. Try saying that fast. Um, which is a temple precinct that has some fantastically stratified archaeological layers and is really, really important for how scholars document the chronology of this period. I'm going to leave it to Josh because I have a three-month-old screaming in yeah, the back. Can you hear that? I'll be right back. So while she goes, <clears throat> we're going to move into the early dynastic period. So, you know, you have the late Uruk period that comes in at the end of the fourth millennium. And uh, the early dynastic begins, um, you know, just at that time, beginning of the third. And the third, it really goes down through the first half of the third millennium all the way down to when, um, essentially, when Sargon begins to reign. So <clears throat> the early dynastic period is broken up into... Um, three parts, one, two, and three. Those are basically distinctions of stylistic changes in the material culture, so, you know, pottery changes and, and other types of stylistic changes. So we're not going <clears> to, <throat> we're not really going to focus on those too terribly much because essentially the basic uh, political system stays the same 
throughout all three uh, of the early dynastic periods. So uh, you still have the basic political unit as the city-state. Isn't his hair fantastic? <clears throat> and uh, the city-state is basically the city itself with a hinterland around it, uh, the countryside. And the um, these city-states each have a deity that um, owns it, is at the top of it. And uh, so when these... Uh, hinterlands and these city-states begin to expand out. Uh, geographically, they come into contact with one another and there's conflict, and that conflict is often seen as... Um, Divine battle that's between right. deities of two different states. That's right. So, um, But there are two parts of the early dynastic period for the purposes of this video that we want to talk about, and that's early dynastic 3A and 3B. Like I said, people in our field are great at naming things. Mm, indeed. In early dynastic 3A, um, which is you know right in the middle of the third millennium, you have uh, we have evidence of a what we call a hexapolis. So six city states that get together um, that seem to fall uh, into a coalition of some sort. And they're Uruk, Adab, Nippur, Lagash, Uma, and Shropak. And from the textual evidence, and again, we'll get into more detail on this in another video, um, it looks like they are aligning themselves under the city of Kish. And whoever rules Kish sort of rules the, the entirety of the Hexapolis. So um, we see this in administrative documents and lexical texts. Also in this period, uh, we have an awful lot of textual evidence from um, Farah and Abu Salabik. And these are really important finds uh, for cuneiform. And uh, again, probably need their own video just to talk about Farhan Abu Salabik. But you'll hear those uh, names come up with respect to the texts. Now in early dynastic 3B, so you have 3A, this hexapolis, this coalition. They have enemies. We don't need to go into all the detail. Now. We think enemies anyway. Uh, certainly they did. But we think we know who they are. In 3B, the, the, the light kind of focuses in... Um, on two city-states, and we have a lot of evidence from them, textual evidence, and uh, they're, they're in conflict. So we see this, uh, an example of this conflict between two city-states that are coming into physical contact with one another, geographical contact. Um, and that is the Uma-Lagash border conflict. Now, um, you know, the Hexapolis has ended, um, and we still see Kish having a, a prominent role, um, you know, the ruler of Kish having a prominent role, uh, kind of mediating things between city states. Um, but Uma and Lagash, you know, are right next to each other, and there's a field, a, a series of fields that are in between, and they're in conflict over them. And so we see documents, um, Steely of the Vultures, uh, is you know probably the big one. Uh, where you see this divine battle uh, taking place uh, along with obviously a physical battle between Uma and Lagash. And of course, the, you know, the documentation that we have is from one side, but uh, this sort of gives us an idea of how these city-states, when they come into conflict with one another, um, how it's conceptualized. That's right, how it's conceptualized and how they interact with one another uh, when that happens. So it's in this period toward the end of the period that we have um, the ruler Lucas Zagezi and um, he defeats Lagash and the rest of southern Babylonia and Lugal Zagezi is then conquered by Sargon and that leads into the first um, really exciting uh, I mean it's all exciting period uh, in Mesopotamian history called the Sargonic period take it away so Sargon um, is, judging by the evidence, probably um, a common man who somehow became king of the city of Kish around 2,333-34 BCE. Um, so he's king of Kish, which is a big deal. Um, earlier in the early dynastic 3B period, Kish is um, kind of like the, the mediator between Umar and Lagash. The king of Kish is the guy who originally demarcated the border between the two cities. Um, so being king of Kish is, is a big deal in Mesopotamia. 
Um, so Sargon becomes king. He moves his capital to the city of Agade, which we unfortunately have not found. Um, well, any- I found it, but I'm not telling anyone. Well, he found it, but he's not telling anyone, which is really rude. So we don't know where Agade is. Um, but he sets his son up as ruler at Kish. Um, there's a whole delightful story about how this happens, but ultimately Sargon conquers all of southern Mesopotamia, which marks the beginning of the so-called First Empire of Akkad, um, which is the earliest known empire for this region and possibly for the world. Um, The dynasty started by Sargon lasts then until 2154 BCE, with four of his descendants ruling the empire. Um, They had to deal with revolts from the southern cities of Babylonia on several occasions, suggesting that the rule of the Akkadians was not well received. Um, And the empire reaches its greatest extent during the reign of Sargon's grandson, Naram-Sin. Naram-Sin is a pretty cool guy. He um, is famous for having deified himself, which is the first known instance of self-deification of a king in Mesopotamia. Um, And the empire finally falls during the reign of Naram-Sin's son, Shah Kalishari, um, apparently from the invasion of several external forces, the Amorites, the Gutians, and the Elamites. Um, as a result of this, the Gutians took over several of the city-states in Mesopotamia, um, in many instances setting themselves up as heirs to the Akkadian Empire, so not trying to uh, draw a line and say, that was then, this is now, we are something new, but trying to foster an idea of continuity from the Akkadian Empire to their own reign, which may have provided some level of um, justification for their rule. Um, in Babylonia, then, the city-state system re-emerges with the fall of the empire, um, and the Gutians remain until Utu Hegal of Uruk drives them out. Um, his brother, Ur Nama, uh, succeeds him and founded the third dynasty of Ur, um, which is Josh's exciting time, so I'm going to take Oliver back, and Josh is going to tell you all about the third dynasty of Ur. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> I'm trying to kiss him to keep him quiet, that's... Uh... <clears throat> I don't know why I thought that would work. Um, okay. So, right, or three. That's yep. where I'm supposed to pick period. up. Fantastic. So the or three period is another really big expansion out. Um, it was founded by Ornama. But the, uh, uh, I, I think the really the most popular uh, king during this, uh, this period. So the, the or three is from the city of Or. It's the third time that Or has been... Um, had a significant dynasty, so that's why it's called the Ur-3 period. It runs from about 2100 to 2000 BCE. And Shulgi is sort of the, the main character that we see. Um, of course, he sets up a, a huge administrative system. He sets up standardization, sort of like Naram Sun did. Um, scribal schools, when we talk about, if you've seen my scribal education video, and they, we talk about um, you know homeschooling, home education, Meaning that scribes learn to do a trade in a very small setting, like a, like a home. Uh, it was during this or three period this large bureaucratic state was set up, and um, this bureaucratic state needed administrators and people like scribes to be able to, to be bureaucrats. And so, it, th- we think the evidence seems to point to um, you know larger scribal schools where state students. Run schools. That's right, state-run schools. Excellent. See. This is why I need her. The other big thing that Shulgi sets up is called the Bala system. And the Bala is like a turn. Um, and, and basically what it is, it's a system of redistribution of um, resources, uh, food, and uh, essentially food resources throughout the heartland of, of uh, Mesopotamia and uh, essentially the, the rural of, uh, of Shulgi's domain. So inside of uh, Mesopotamia, inside of his rule, Sumer and Akkad, uh, you had what he called the heartland. And he didn't call it. That's, that's essentially what it is. Uh, it's broken up into 20 provinces, and each of the provinces, each of the, the various areas have specializations. So down in the marshes, you have people that are really good at, you know, have a lot of fishing, uh, fishing able to do a lot of fishing, you know, but maybe uh, another area is you know, good at producing barley. And so those areas are responsible for those commodities and they bring those commodities to a central collection point. And 
uh, that central collection point then redistributes uh, you know, a, a set amount of the commodities to uh, each of the other regions that are bringing their one specialized commodity. So uh, it's a redistribution center. Now in the periphery, uh, particularly over east of the Tigris, uh, Shulgi set up um, Shagina, their um, military personnel, military rulers, um, officials, uh, over those uh, ruled provinces, those ruled areas, and they were responsible for bringing different commodities, shipping those in. Livestock. Uh, yeah, livestock primarily. That's correct. Um, see, you got she's she's on to these details, which is awesome. Um, and they were responsible for making sure that they got into the heartland as well. But that's the big. It's such a the 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 administrative system that was set up uh, is what's really key there. Mm -hmm. And again, it lasts for about 100 years after Shulgi's death. Um, Amar Suen and Shu Suen, uh, you know, rule. And then Ibi Suen is the final ruler um, of the dynasty, and um, it falls under him. So <clears throat> there is a general of his named Ishbi Era. And this, this sort of thing seems to happen, you know, the power starts to wane. And um, somebody else vies for power, and so as power starts to wane under Ibisuin, the empire is you know is declining. We have external invasion, internal revolts, and you can see this in some of the documentation. There's a text called "The Lament Over the Destruction of Sumer and Or," or "The Lament Over Or," two different documents, um, and they describe this sort of breakdown. Uh, the provinces stop contributing to the Bala system. There's a barley shortage, and Ishbi Era is sort of sent out to um, fix it. To fix it, to right? To try and find more barley. That's exactly right. So he doesn't do that. No, he doesn't. Uh, he sort of says, "Hey, I I can bring that barley back to you, but um, you're gonna have to give me how many? Anyway, all the money. That's right. All the money for all the barley. And yeah, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't. So, but Ishbi Era. Uh, becomes the ruler, the, the, the first ruler, of the Isin Larsa period. So he rules from Isin. See, again, with these catchy, catchy names. The Isin, yeah, so Isin first and then Larsa, uh, two different cities. And uh, so Ishbira begins the rule there, and that sh that transitions from um, Ibisuin's reign at the end of the War Three period into Ishbira's rule in uh, the Isin Larsa period, which begins in 2004. Yeah. Roughly. So the Isin Lhasa period runs from 2004 to 1763 BCE. Um, there's a very minimal break between the Orthri and Isin Lhasa periods. Uh, Babylonia recovers really quickly. Um, and as Josh alluded to, the period is so named because the central power shifts from a dynasty at Isin, founded by Ishbi Era, to a dynasty that rules at the city of Lhasa. And this is one of those contracting times. Yes. Yeah. So the uh, the Isin Lhasa kings don't rule over the entirety of the All Three Empire. Kind of things break off at the edges, and it's really just a much smaller um, area that they have control of. Um, so Isin originally rules over Lhasa and several other, other city states, um, but then at the end of the reign of Lipid Ishtar, uh, 1924 BCE, the city that is Lhasa has become independent and itself controls the cities of Nippur and Or. Uh, which is very significant. Nippur is the religious center of Mesopotamia throughout most of history, and Or is the capital of the Or Three Empire, so um, has a lot of political sway at this point in time. So to control both the religious center and what has been the political center um, is quite a shift in power for the Lhasa kings. Um, so Isin is ultimately defeated and captured by the Lhasa king Warad Sin, who rules from 1834 to 1823 BCE, um, and then his successor proceeds to consolidate power in southern Babylonia. Uh, he captures several cities, including Uruk and Babylon, um, and I mean, rules himself until Hammurabi of Babylon finally defeats him in 1763 BCE. Um, kind of running concurrent to this is what's known as the Old Assyrian period. We have a, a video up, a daily data about marriage in the Old Assyrian period. Um, so it's um, it refers to a period mainly in northern Mesopotamia 
between roughly 2000 to 1837 BCE. Um, and the primary characteristic of this is trade with um, a site in Anatolia, that is Turkey, called Karim Karnesh. Um, we don't have to go into a great amount of detail here, because we do, but she wants to. I'm not going to, but I really like the Old Assyrian period. It's very interesting. But we have that video. Um, we'll have more videos on the Old Assyrian yeah, yeah. period, because I like it. If you want to just do a, maybe like a brief. Very brief. So basically, there are traders from the city of Ashur in northern Mesopotamia that travel up to Turkey. They take from Mesopotamia um, tin and textiles, and they trade it in Anatolia for silver, which they then send back to their families in Ashur. Um, these merchant families, the men establish a trading colony in Anatolia, um, marry local women, have children, and stay there really until uh, the end of their lives. Um, yeah, it's it's just a cool period. So and we've I'll, got about 20,000 tablets from many, that. Many, many tablets, including a whole load of personal letters, which is cool. Yeah. Um, they probably wouldn't have wanted us to read them. Probably not. That's tough. right. Um, it's also um, a period that provides fantastic evidence for functional literacy. Hmm. Um, it's used to suggest that actually literacy may have been wider spread in Mesopotamia than was originally thought. Um, the scribe, well, not the scribes, the merchants who were writing these letters used a shortened uh, sign list so they could communicate without having to spend several years learning the hundreds and hundreds of cuneiform signs that mm. um, classically trained scribes would have to have known. So, I have restricted myself. You should be very grateful. We'll do more Old Assyrian period later. Uh, so now Josh is going to take over to the Old Babylonian period. Okay, so this is be the last thing that we talk about in this video. The Old Babylonian period is pretty complex. It uh, really is. Interesting. It really it is. Just, there's a lot of political maneuvering that goes on. Yeah, so you remember how we talked about there's a, you know, a wide exp or a, uh, an expansion and then a contraction, an expansion, contraction. This is sort of the, the in-between and you have um, areas around uh, in Mesopotamia, this, you know, person holds control up here and then this other person you know holds control over here and over there's here. lots of competing political entities that are larger than city states but not large enough to really be called an empire that's right should we call them a kingdom yeah that's what we'll call them kingdoms so it's it begins with shamshi adad and uh, he rules the kingdom of upper mesopotamia from 1833 to 1776 by the way these dates um I wouldn't call them fixed. Uh, in fact, you can't call them fixed. Um, there are three different possible chronologies we're using. Yeah, the middle chronology. The usually. middle chronology. Um, we could. We could. Let's not go into that right yeah, now. Yeah, let's not. We'll go do that later. Anyway, um, just don't go hanging your head on any particular date that we give you. Um, so anyway, uh, Shamshiada captures the city of Mari, which becomes a very important city in this old Babylonian period. In 1792, he places his younger son, Yasmach Adu, over Mari. And then sends him letters, basically telling him he's doing an appalling job, and why can't he be more like his big brother? Yeah. Like, Sorry, <laughs> it, I love that it, bit. It definitely is like a father of the year sort of thing. I really model um, how I do things around here after <laughs> Shamshi Adu. Just kidding, I don't. Anyway, uh, so Yasmach Adu is over Mari. His older son, Ishmael Dagan, is over Akalatum. And he himself rebuilds Talelan and sets it up as Shubat Enlil and rules from there. So that's the upper part of Mesopotamia. You have Elam over in the in the east, a Kalatum, I mean um, Eshnuna there on the top. But anyway, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the big name, the big kingdom that everybody wants to talk about, which is great because, you know, we named our channel after him is Mr. Hammurabi himself, and Hammurabi uh, rules Babylon and develops Babylonia. He's, he's not a major player to begin with, though. That's right. At the beginning of this period, Babylon is a relatively small, not terribly important provincial town. Yeah. Um, it's not until the death of Shamshiada that Hammurabi really comes into his own. So, like, the city of Kish near Babylon goes through this period uh, sort of being controlled by... Uh, one small region and then that small region sort of becomes weak and it has a ruler itself of its own city and then 
and then it shifts again, and then it has its own ruler. So it, it, there's not this, you know, one big power in the region that, that takes over. There's a lot of over. jockeying for position. That's exactly right. Between Hammurabi and, well, actually another Lhasa yeah. king, Rimsin the second, or is it first? It's Rimsin the first. But Hammurabi puts an end to that, don't he you does. worry. He does. Um, so Hammurabi rules from 1792 to 1750. At first, as Megan said, he served Shamshi Adad, uh, made an alliance with him. Um, and after Shamshi Adad's death, that you know the one that ruled the kingdom of Upper Mesopotamia, you have some some major players in the area. They are Mari, which is ruled by Zimri Lim, Hammurabi, who rules Babylon, and then you have Ashnuna, Elam, and Larsa. And we really don't want to go into any more detail than that uh, in this video because. It's actually pretty complex. It's really neat. And you we can see through the Mari letters. Long story short, Hammurabi is a lying, treacherous bastard. <sighs> Not that I'm biased. Sorry. Um, yeah. yeah he's, he is. That's true. <laughs> but he has just verdicts, which he puts in his stele. So he does. The it's, gods like him, so it's, it's all It's totally okay. cool. Um, but he eventually wins. So there are alliances that are made, coalitions to go attack this other area. You know, um, anyway, we won't go Hammurabi into Hammurabi steals Zimri Lim's troops at one point. That's right. Zimri Lim's like, give me back my troops. Hammurabi's like, no. We have the letters. I hey, need them. send me back my troops. <laughs> nope, sorry. Um, anyway, uh, eventually Hammurabi defeats them all and, you know, coalesces power there and sets up the first dynasty of Babylon. Of course, we see the Steely of Hammurabi come uh, toward the end of his reign, showing those just verdicts. And um, his son, Samsu Aluna, takes over. Uh, Abi Eishuk, Ami Ditana, Ami Saduka have a pen out. There's going to be a quiz. And uh, Samsu Ditana. Finally, uh, of course, under Samsu Ditana, things have gotten very weak and, um, you know, it's... You know, it's set up for somebody to come take it over from the outside like it always does. And the Hittite kingdom, who's up in Turkey, has been gaining power during this period. Uh, the ruler, Morsili I, comes down and sacks a very weakened Babylon and ends the first dynasty of Babylon in 1595. And with it, the old Babylonian period. So we had an awesome ending filmed and then our computer decided that it really didn't like us. Mm -mm. So then the sound went bup, 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 bup. so we're filming a new ending. So Oh right. Oh, sorry. Oh you know what? Maybe I should move that. Uh so right, I kinda gave an overview of what's coming in part two. Uh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh so the lights go off after Babylon gets sacked in fifteen ninety five. No more documentation. No more documentation, right? That's what it means. Uh, when the lights come back on from a document perspective, archaeological perspective, um, we see that um, there's another power in place, the Kassites. Uh, and not only that, but there's this big power, po great powers club. We've talked about it in one of the other mm -hmm. videos. International that, Diplomacy Daily Data. Come on, somebody. Um, so we'll talk more in more detail about that. And... Um, the Middle Assyrian period at the end of the second millennium, of course, is part of this um, Great Powers Club. And uh, that moves into the New Assyrian period with the, the, the Assyrian Empire, uh, eventually uh, grows and becomes very, very powerful, it has a, a very wide um, uh, rule. They take over Egypt. That's right. Which is a pretty big deal. Yeah, it is. I think, I think so. so. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh. And then, uh, of course, the Neo-Babylonian Empire eventually conquers the Neo-Assyrian Empire. And, of course, all of you that study the Hebrew Bible uh, probably will recognize a lot of the names, like Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and then the Achaemenid Empire, Seleucid Empire. So we'll, we'll get into all of that. And um, that should bring us to sort of the 3000 to 323 uh, range uh, that we're trying to cover uh, mostly in what we do on our channel. So yep. uh, stay tuned next week. Uh, see part two, and we'll see you then. Yay.